So I'm Martinez, and today, together with my colleague Daniel, we'd like to present some interesting kernel issues which we found while developing Cilium DataPath. So we both are full-time Cilium DataPath developers, and in addition to that, Daniel is uh, one of the maintainers of the PPF tree in the kernel. So let's start. So before we dive into the main content, I think it's good to have some background information on the Cilium data path. So in LPC 2019 and 2020, we talked a lot about it. So in particular about the load balancing component. So for this year, I think it's good to sh show some of the change long since last year. So the main change is that the Cilium is no longer tied to Kubernetes, which means that it can run as a standalone L4 load balancer and this comes with additional changes such as consistent hashing support in particular maglev algorithm for backend selection then we have a pcap recorder which is used for uh, load balancer traffic observability purpose and then we have a data path extension for the health probing of backends and the main principle of the LB, at least, uh, components is that we want to try to be as close as possible to the socket when it comes to the east-west traffic and as close as possible to the driver for the north-south traffic. And all our data path programs are running in the form of PPF programs and we are basically using TCXTP layer and in addition to that, uh, the socket layer via C group hooks. Okay, so let's move on. So the stock is split into four unrelated parts. So first we're gonna talk about C group V1, V2 interference, which became obvious after some distros have enabled both by default at the same time. And then another thing is the TCP pacing in the context of the Cilium's bandwidth manager, which we talked a bit last year. Uh, third, we're going to talk about some problems in terms of the LT L2 entries management and L3 entries lookups, which complicates not only the Cilium's data path, but also the control plane. And finally, we'll talk about possible extensions of the PPF maps to support the wildcard lookups for the observability purpose. Okay, giving control to Daniel. All right, thanks. So let's first start with the C group V1, V2. Um, so here's a basic overview of a typical layout. Um, so if you dump the CSFS C group tree on the vast majority of distributions, you will see uh, something like that, where you have a long list of uh, C group V1 controllers um, that are mounted, and then there's the unified C group V2 uh, mount. And in order to add BPF programs, we of course have to attach them to the C group V2 uh, root in this case. So on the typical host that runs in Kubernetes and where Solume agent is uh, loaded, it will basically attach programs to, like for the load balancing in particular in this case, uh, to the connect, send message, receive message, get peer name and bind hook. And then basically do, it, it will do a DNAT, so whenever, um, the application calls, like let's say a connect system call, it will rewrite the socket address structures in the kernel so that you can directly hook up one of the backends. Um, and recently, like one of the projects from Kubernetes side that got quite popular um, among DevOps and so on is, is called Kind, which is called Kubernetes in Docker. And here you can basically, the goal of Kind is to simulate Kubernetes nodes in your whole cluster, basically on a single host. So your host here basically has uh, Docker containers, which represent them, uh, themselves as a Kubernetes node, and you have multiple of them. And in this case, uh, the, the C group mounts basically like they, they are namespace. So they're still under system as C group for the container which has the Kubernetes node in particular, but in the initial namespace, they have a different subpath, of course. And yeah, so what the agent does in that case is it loads the, 
eBPF programs, of course, to the to the root in this case to the SysFSC group inside the uh, container, so that it's on the root from a Kubernetes node perspective as it was before. Um, and in the initial namespace, there's nothing attached because that's basically out of reach for the for the agent itself. And to to give some context, where now like the problematic bit comes in, in into play here. Uh, so longer time ago, when uh, the secret v2 was added, uh, basically the the v1 case had tagging information for uh, for the NetCLS and the prior controllers. NetCLS is basically like the original idea was basically that uh, you can move applications into this particular C group and then all their sockets that they uh, spawn um, uh, have a specific uh, tag that can be user defined. And then later on in the TC, for the TCQ disk, it would uh, help the classification of the traffic. And similarly, the net prior, um, it's basically for uh, giving a, um, a packet priority for that, also for the TC case in the end. Um, and then later on, like when the C group V2 uh, was added to that, uh, the socket basically got another pointer to point to the C group V2 object. And in order to not bloat the socket structure too much uh, because of performance reasons, it was basically both put into a union uh, so that we can like in total have only eight bytes and that's it. Um, yeah, but in reality, as you've seen, like from the different, uh, like from the previous slides in the directory structure, um, it's very likely that both flavors amount at the same time. And how does it look in the fast path? So whenever we want to execute a BPF program, such as for the connect system call, um, like the socket secret pointer uh, helper function will basically retrieve the corresponding uh, C group V2 object. And whenever there is like, because of this overloading, whenever there's a uh, tagging um, from the C group V1, in place, we basically have to fall back to the to the root C group of the C group we do. If you don't have to compile it in, well, then all is great, but it's not <laughs> typically the case. And yeah, so why is this problematic uh, for those environments? Uh, well, because like if you have to fall back to the C group we, um, to the C group we do root, it's the root in the initial namespace. So whatever is attached uh, inside such a simulated Kubernetes node is being bypassed and there's nothing attached in the, in the initial namespace. And that basically means like an agent that is attaching something to the root uh, for that Kubernetes node cannot do anything about it, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, so it's so like that management is basically complex and cumbersome because it's not compatible with C group namespaces. I mean, like with the non C group path, it, it was uh, kind of clear, but if you would attach to the root and then your namespace, your uh, you, you basically will inevitably run into those problems. There's also um, a trade-off that was made originally. So uh, when you are already attached to a V2 and you have a reference to it and then switch later on to the V1, to the secret V1 controller, uh, you will leak basically the secret V2 object references, which is also not that pleasant, but it was deemed accept, uh, acceptable back then as a trade-off. Uh, yeah, so, but overall like this, invocation like you, there, there's always like a weak point where it's not reliable um, because like third party or other agents where you don't have control over in the cluster they could step on like on, on onto each other and typically also like distributions they usually enable as we know everything for maximum com compatibility so yeah the approach that uh, we, we, we took in terms of fixing this situation is basically to bite the bullet and, and to detangle both. So that in the end, like the C group data structure holds basically both like the C group pointer and then like the legacy stuff. And hopefully at some point in the future, we will be able to uh, uh, retire it, um, but we'll see, yeah. Uh, implicitly, this will also fix the read to reference count leaks. So yeah, the fix has already, it's already been out and has already been upstreamed uh, recently. Uh, but yeah, if you have any comments, I'm happy to answer uh, questions um, around that. We can also do this at the end, potentially. Um, the next case that I would like to talk about um, is basically around TCP pacing uh, for Kubernetes parts out of the initial namespace. Um, just to give some background on current state and what's possible. 
And in Kubernetes, basically, there's a so-called bandwidth annotation. Uh, it's basically something that you add to the pod spec when you deploy a specific pod to, to your uh, Kubernetes cluster. And you can say then, okay, like this pod has uh, egress bandwidth of 50 megabits, for example. And enforcing this uh, annotation, it's basically optional to parse it and to enforce it, but there are some plugins, uh, some CNI plugins that can do it. Originally, there was only the bandwidth plugin, which is one of the official or maybe semi-official uh, Kubernetes plugins. And we recently also added this to Cilium. And basically the semantics is more or less defined by the implementation from the plugin. Uh, the Kubernetes bandwidth plugin, it's, it's a really crude hack. It basically adds an IFB uh, uh, device uh, for the ingress um, bandwidth enforcement and then attaches a token bucket filter to that. Uh, same for the egress and I think um, as far as I'm aware it, it attaches this to the to all the weave devices in the host namespace for the enforcement. Uh, we took a different approach and we only um, so we only implemented the egress bandwidth annotation for that and uh, basically the agent then from Solium uh, is, is attaching FQQ disk um, to all the physical devices in the host, and then it will use PPF to uh, basically set the timestamp and then with the earliest departure, like enforcement in FQ, um, uh, like to enforce this, this rate limitation. So that, that's basically an overview picture here of what I just mentioned and uh, what you can see here above is like how the part spec looks like in that case. Uh, just to give some overview on the, on the, on, the, on, the, on the data path. So basically we have a BPF program attached on the physical device and then on the uh, host weave devices. And we use like the redirection out of the TC layer. There was a talk from last year's LBC for more details into that. On the way out, um, we basically use the FIP lookup and then either like the direct BPF redirect or through the neighboring subsystem. And, and in terms of this enforcement, uh, what, uh, what I just mentioned earlier, um, thanks to the fact that uh, when traffic from a from a pod networking stack leaves uh, uh, or uh, leaves the or is trying to leave the node, it will first switch network namespaces, and there the socket association is still preserved. And then um, the BPF program on that host weave will basically mark all the pods into a into a traffic aggregate and. The BPF program, once it's, it's finally reached the physical device, um, on TC egress will basically set the SKB timestamp based on the rate limit uh, that was pushed down from Kubernetes side into a BPF map. And then like the MQ and FQ leave QDISC will then enforce it. And the uh, socket association is still there until that point, which is great. And now like the next step that we would actually love to get working is to um, have a socket inside the pod network namespace uh, define its own uh, either max pacing rate or it, it would use BBR as a congestion control algorithm, which also uses spacing implicitly, and then have this enforcement on the on the initial namespace and the physical NIC. And today it's basically not working because uh, we have to reset the timestamp to zero when we uh, switch to network namespaces and. Therefore, like the, the FQ on, on, on the physical device cannot do it. And if you look at, uh, uh, like, uh, like if you would enforce a rate, for example, four gigabit per second, um, this basically looks completely unstable if you try and run that perf uh, with that. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's not working. Um, we did a POC uh, hack in that sense where we just, try to play around and uh, try to retain the egress timestamp from the TC, like from the TCP stack of the pod and did not reset it on the network namespace switch and with that you get the nice uh, stable rate. Um, and like just the, the rationals and, and, and some background on why there is a uh, why this uh, timestamp reset is needed. So basically the, the kernel uses uh, different clock bases for the SKB timestamp. One is on ingress where it uses the clock tie, which is at the international um, atomic time. Um, and on the egress side, we use a monotonic clock and the same is for FQ. So basically if you would not reset this, 
then the forwarding from Rx to, to Tx would basically cause a drop in, in the FQQ disk because it would uh, overreach the uh, drop horizon. So usually FQ internally does, I think it's by default maybe like five seconds or you can also configure this lower to potentially two seconds. If, if, if a packet has a timestamp that is further out in the future to that, it will just drop it uh, so that it doesn't have to keep it in the queue for too long. And right now there's no, no way to figure out like uh, what timestamp is being used and hence like this uh, reset is currently needed. And the question is maybe like, can it be normalized to a single base? So in, like in the past, uh, Eric and others, they uh, tried to use the like clock tie as, as, as well for the egress uh, timestamp. And there was an issue on the mailing list where, some, where, some, where someone reported with the, like some weird embedded device that this broke their communication. Uh, because like the real time clock on that node was uh, uh, set up in, in a broken way. And then like when the node booted, uh, I think system D was like uh, adding offset for plus 50 years and yeah, things break. Um, so that's why like uh, the eager side had to go back to a clock monotonic. And now we have this, this reset. So the, the question is, um, or maybe one proposal could be like to fix the situation uh, where we could get this to work. Uh, what I like from the scenario earlier to add a new bit to the SKB where we have like a timestamp base. And when it's, let's say zero, it's, it's basically the, the clock basis as a tie. And if it's one, it's, it's the monotonic clock. And we could have helpers for the, for, to, to use that from RX and TX side. And uh, the FQQ disk could then detect that if the timestamp is not a monotonic timestamp, it would reset it to zero and uh, it would then implicitly, uh, you know, like treat it as, as today, as, as if we would forward it. Uh, and otherwise it would just enqueue it properly. Um, and then we could potentially remove all this uh, setting to zero up and forwarding. Uh, one thing that is an issue actually here is that the net timestamp check uh, function where we basically timestamp all the RX packets, uh, it would have to be deferred after TC ingress. So like when we go into the local stack, it would have to happen at the later point in time. Yeah, are there any uh, question comments from anyone? So the net timestamp check, is that what sets the timestamp if it isn't set by hardware as well? Yes, exactly. And why does it have to be deferred? Well, otherwise, like we, like on uh, like when traffic uh, crosses the network namespace from a part, then we are basically back in the RX, like in, in, in the receive path. And we call the main uh, receive routine and there is like this net timestamp check in there as well. And uh, it, it would basically override it. And, we, and like in order to retain uh, like a monotonic clock on the SKB we, um, so that we can forward it from TC ingress all the way to the physical device, we would have to do it at a later point in time, I think. Oh, so that you can get to it in BPF before it gets reset. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that has a potential to slightly delay measurements of how long the packet was in the system, right? Potentially, yes. I'm not sure if that's significant, but that could be a concern. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think this sounds great to actually get this working. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I was wondering, you know, this um, base of the timestamps, uh, because we now have the the new uh, new time namespace. So maybe. Uh, a single bit uh, might be not uh, good enough. I'm not sure. If we want to allow, you know, um, a container to have a different um, uh, namespace for the for the time. So obviously, the the, 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 the even the monotonic time would be different for this uh, namespace. Oh, I see. Okay. So, but I'm not sure how it can be handled right now. I'm not sure if we have a convenient helpers to convert, let's say, when a packet escapes uh, from one namespace and enters a new na time namespace, if we have a way to 
convert this time mm -hmm. stamp into the <laughs> the current namespace. That's a good point. I did not take this into consideration at all. Yeah, I will I will look into that. Um, how we could do that and issues with it. And I, I presume there's also no way like to have the other way around to have everything in terms of monotonic clock and then convert from from there to a, to a, a clock tie, right? I think that's probably not feasible either. That I know. Mm. Okay. You no, know, the when the t the the the, the, the time stamping stuff was added uh, by uh, I don't remember from Intel someone from Intel added yeah. that. But yeah. Their proposal included uh, some bits in the SKB to tell if the what was the base of the the time stamp. And for for some reason we fight we fought hard about about adding new bits in the SKB. So I think that's a historical reason why we don't have this bit yet. But if there is some convincing case of why we need them, then maybe we should add them at some point. Yeah. Could BPF be responsible for converting? Like if you if you need to move the point of reset anyway, maybe we could just have BPF be responsible for mm -hmm. converting. So like yeah, I mean, that's a good question as well. Like the initial hack that I did, I mean, it's, I don't think it's upstreamable because it's way too ugly. You would still have to have some way to avoid hearing the timestamp when you scrub the SKB, right? And that's what's currently happening when you switch namespaces. So you would have to have some mechanism that's not too hacky <laughs> um, to do that. And then, I mean, like the rest could, could be done from from BPF, right? But like, I don't know, like. Could BPF set a bit that it. disables, like that disables the scrapping or copy it into the so, CB or something? I would love to, uh, I mean like, so, so my approach was, I would love to avoid um, having to manage anything inside the pod namespace. So I, I, I don't want to attach a BPF program there on the on the weave device in the network namespace and then set this set this bit. I would love that this would work without any cooperation um, between the pod namespace and the host namespace, so that the host can just uh, uh, deal with it. Um, this all this always goes via a via device, right? Yeah. yeah. So flying I mean, potentially on other things. On via. Say again. So could we set a bit on the VF device telling us that we'll handle it on ingress when it comes out? Could also be an option. Um, I thought it was maybe too ugly because how do you configure this? And it's quite implementation specific as well. Do we really want to expose this implementation detail uh, to clear it or not clear it? And yeah, so it, didn't feel clean enough somehow. Um, yeah. Anyway, like in the interest of time, I will move on because there's still other things to cover as well. Um, but definitely it's a good discussion. Um, so the, the next part that we have is uh, on the L2 and L3 management uh, for the load balancer. Uh, basic idea like the load, you know, the so in load balancer and, and, and also other XTP based load balancers, they are sitting in the middle here uh, and get the traffic from switch with ECMP based load balancing and then move it uh, to a backend. Um, and uh, typically the way it does, you know, the, uh, it's directed to a service IP import and then forwards it to a backend IP import, uh, either to DNAT and afterwards SNAT, which we do in a queue proxy replacement or DSR with IP IP encapsulation, but in both cases, really like the backend IP is the destination address. And we've been using the FIP lookup helper to piggyback on the, on the neighbor resolution. And then in the end, the load balancer is pushing it back out through XDPTX. And right now the neighbor resolution, I mean, you, what you cannot do is from XDP side, if it's not in the neighbor table to suddenly start resolving and, and do up requests and because you cannot hold the packet. Uh, so basically, it already has to be present in that case. Right now, we 
uh, it's, it's one of our pain points and we have a hack in our agent where we resolve entries manually and then push them down as a permanent entry into the neighbor table, but it's not great and it definitely has limitations. So uh, how does it look like? If there's an event like from the Cube API server that the new node came up and it, it's one of the backends, for example, uh, then it will tell all the other uh, um, agents from, from some pseudonym site and it will do the R ping and it gets the resolution, it pushes it down. Um, and it has to do it periodically. So right now, I think we do it every five minutes or so. I think it's also probably suboptimal. Uh, but the bucky case here is really that, that there's a small race. Um, so when we have like an obsolete, an obsolete term permanent entry for the node where the Cube API server is running on, and then like uh, the, the Selenium Asian would restart and that Cube API server node L2 address changed, then you basically would lose connectivity, which is not uh, which is horrible. Uh, and the other thing that it also doesn't do is like it, it doesn't automatically update for active traffic. Like when traffic comes up the stack, uh, it, it's still like because it's a permanent entry and externally managed, it's not doing that either. And it's duplication of the existing logic and so on. We need an equivalent for IPv6. Um, so uh, basically the requirements that, that uh, we would have as a control plane is, is um, uh, one thing we initially look up when the node comes up based on the IP address, we look up um, from that link side, the kernel, uh, if the backend IP is in the same L2 address or if it's uh, accessible to a gateway IP address. And then what would be nice is to push it down as an L3 address without the corresponding L2 and then let the neighbor table just handle the resolution. Um, and in addition to keep it uh, in reachable state, uh, also to avoid garbage collector eviction and then later on if if you have a restart of the agent the agent would would be nice to know like which of those uh, entries were managed by the agent so that you can clean up obsolete ones um one thing we can piggyback on uh i was not aware of this earlier but reading through the code uh there's already an ntf use state uh or no it's a new d use state uh, sorry about that in a flag NTF externally learns so that would get us quite close already. So the, the NUD used state, if you push an entry down, uh, it would do the neighbor resolution in the kernel already, but it would only do it once. And then it, uh, like the, if the entry gets stale, it would get updated back to reachable if there are external traffic events or internal ones, uh, which require a, a new resolution. Uh, and because of the externally learned flag, uh, that was added, uh, it ensures that we're not adding to the garbage collector list. Uh, but what it does not do, it's not automatically refreshing it back into the reachable state. And what we also don't do is like we don't propagate those creation flags uh, back to user space. And they are also not retained on carrier down events, so as, as opposed to the permanent entries. Uh, so one of the design um, and uh, points here is that we could add a new uh, NUD managed state and it would be a volatile state. So it would not be, it, it would not stay there. It would uh, change like into, into reachable, for example. Um, and it would add it to like a per neighbor table list so that there's like a delayed uh, work queue which would trigger the, the uh, resolution periodically. And this could, this could be combined with the externally learned one to avoid garbage collection and also could be retained in the uh, on, on carrier down events. Uh, so this is how it looks like. Um, you would basically add it with the externally learned flag that already exists and then NUD managed and then here's what you would get back and it would get refreshed automatically in reachable state. Um, and given there's a bit of time issue, I will hand over to Martinez right now for the L3 bits and we can do the Q and A in the end. Uh, okay, okay, so let's move to one layer up. So in particular to the fib lookups. So some in some situations in the Cilium data path, we need to determine a source IP address of a packet, which has been modified by the data plane. So in particular, let's consider this example. So we have a pod client sending a request to outside, which needs to be masqueraded. And for this reason, we have a BPF program attached to TC egress, Cilium data path program, which is masquerading that request. 
And the if device on which this program is running has two IP addresses selected. So currently what we do in the data path is basically that we hard code the IP address with the agent when it generates the program, it selects the IP address according to some heuristics it implements. And it works fine when the device has just a single IP address, but it doesn't work when it has multiple addresses. So yeah, in this case, the reply from outside would be probably a black hole. So what we want to do instead, instead we would like to use the BPF fib lookup and we want it to set the source IP address if it hasn't been set before by us. And because this information is already available in the FIP table. So we had for, for this, we have a proposal extension, which we are going to upstream soon. So it's basically to add the new flag, basically saying that, okay, so if we don't set the source IP address, please set for us. And this is basically also nice, not only for devices with multiple IP addresses cases, but also that we, from the Cilium agent perspective, we don't have to hard code the IP addresses into the data path anymore, and they can be retrieved from the FIB table. So another problem with the FIB lookups is that in the case of multi-home networks, so in this example, we have a LB node, which is basically doing the service translation. So it translates the request so it does DNAT to some particular backend it selects. And it works fine when you have uh, one single interface for egressing those translated packets, but it doesn't work fine when you have multiple devices. And we have to basically, again, to replicate some logic of FIB lookups in the data path to support this case. And Instead of doing that, I think it's because this information is again, it's available in FIB table, we'd like to do again FIB lookup. And if we don't set the target interface index, we'd like the helper to set it for us when it returns. And actually after closer inspection to the code, it seems to be the case because there's this uh, setting of the interface index. But unfortunately, if you don't specify the if index by yourself, when you do the helper call, the check, which is above the setting fails. And I think it shouldn't be the case when you don't set the BPF FIB lookup direct. So again, we have a change, just a matter of cycles to upstream it. Okay, yeah, then Daniel, back to wildcarded BPF map lookups. Okay, so that's the last topic and then we can do a short uh... Q&A afterwards. Um, so the use case is basically on the load balancer uh, to correlate inbound outbound packets and to have a recorder for that so that you can introspect, uh, for example, like the path taken from fabric to layer four load balancer to layer seven ones, proxies or backends. Um, on, like on, on the agent, there's an out of band mechanism where you can program this. And we have a component called Hubble where you can basically then construct a pcap file out of the rules for that. Um, there's a, unfortunately here, we cannot like uh, play the, the GIF or so, but in the slides you can, there, there's a link to it where you can see a small demo. Uh, Hubble basically here, uh, but also any other con, uh, consumer of this API could, could specify a given filter. And then the agent internally will push this down into the BPF XDP data path. It will create a wildcard mask and uh, like if there are multiple entries with the same uh, sort of uh, masking, there will be two users here that will keep track of this and then regenerate the, the data path basically. So how does it look uh, from, a, from a flow perspective? Um, so first we have this classification where that this particular traffic is subject to uh, where we have a packet capture for that. And if so, it will, it will store basic information in a per CPU cache. Um, and like push the original one into the perfing buffer. And later on it will, uh, like the perfing buffer itself, it has some additional metadata like the recorder ID and then like the PCAP header, but with monotonic time and then the full or partial packet capture. And then later on after the encapsulation, for example, when we push it to the backend, uh, we consult the per CPU cache whether there was a prior match and then we push the corresponding uh, egress packet out. Um, 
So like such a uh, recorder consists basically of a source cider, destination cider, then source destination port. There, there can be a, uh, zero for any or like a direct match. What we don't support is a range of ports. And in terms of protocol, either any like TCP, UDP, whatever, or a direct match. Um, and then, like, as I said, the agent has basically an API that is exposed. It's tracking the different masks from the rules and regenerates the data path whenever there was a change in the masks. And then it uses a single v4 and one for v6, a hash table for the for the rules to look it up. Uh, how that looks like, uh, super briefly. Um, this is basically generated by the agent. So that's like the set of masks. Um, and uh, like whenever that changes, it regenerates it. it. Then it derives a lookup key based on the original uh, tuple from the packet on the given prefix mask and then on the actual, uh, like on the target key that we then want to use for the lookup itself. And if there was a match, it holds basically uh, some information about ID and capturing length. And this is basically how we uh, generate this uh, key for the lookup itself. But overall, it's just like a poor man's version of a wildcard match. And like one thing that we assume is that the number of, uh, that the set of those masks is small, but overall what it would allow for nevertheless is like a large number of matches that are within this mask set. So that's still acceptable for the use case that we have, but uh, it's suboptimal because it requires expensive on the fly recompilation and you also need to go and linearly probe for those masks. It works on all the kernels, but there's of course always the risk that things get too complex for the verifier to understand. And it would be nice to have like a native wildcard BPF map uh, in the kernel overall to have basically fast lookup time in the order of millions per second, reasonably fast update time. I think that would be totally sufficient in the, if it's in the order of thousands per second. And going back on the mailing list, I think in 2018, there was already a discussion back with BPF and OVS where they wanted to implement mega flows in BPF, but that stalled a bit. Uh, we, we've been looking into uh, recently, like what's state of the art in terms of the typical packet classification algorithms. And it seems to be like double merge um, is so far the best choice in terms of, uh, that, that's an extract from the paper here, but in terms of the classification time and also the update time. Um, and even if you have large number of rules, uh, like at least the simulation from the paper looked promising. Uh, but so far we didn't look into a POC implementation yet. That's going to be next on our to-do list. Um, but yeah, it would be nice with that to solve this problem that we don't need the recompilations and so on. Um, but if anyone has any comments or experience or like uh, had similar issues and how they solved it, I would be super curious. And yeah, with that uh, basically opening up for questions. Thank you, Daniel and Martinez for the great talk. It was so dense, so much information in, <clears throat> in 30 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was hard to follow. Um, I have a few questions. Can you go back like one slide, like first start from the last? Yeah, so for the, this is, this is great. So like, I, it just my like two cents here that, yeah, if we can get this, uh, any of these algorithms, whichever one is makes sense to implement given kernel constraints like not every user space algorithm is acceptable to the kernel so yeah. the kernel might twist the dynamics of this uh, applicability of the algorithm but yeah it would be like awesome i think uh but like as a first uh but have you have you looked at the uh, map for each helper instead of uh, regenerating masks? Mm, nope, not yet. I mean, like we, like so far, we needed this on a 
5.4 kernel for, ah, okay. uh, for for the user which was running the load balancer in in production. But um, yeah, for later ones, we definitely need to look into that. Um, yeah, that yeah but I, uh, overall, I totally agree with you. I mean, it has to comply with RCU and, and all the other things, and and not everything works, of course. Like, a, yeah, the like the tuple search space algorithm used by uh, was used by OBS um, tuple merge in the paper. At least they claim it's like the lookup. At least seems to be at least seven times faster. Update times around. 35% slower than TSS, but I mean, overall those are simulation results. So it, it, yeah, it would be good to uh, to have a experimental implementation and, and, and test it out how it looks. Uh, David is wondering in the chat whether tuple merge is patent encumbered. Oh, That's okay. This algorithm. I have no idea. I mean, it was uh, like the... <laughs> <laughs> So the the author of the paper and the and the so he's he's from academia, but to be honest, I haven't looked. I this didn't cross my mind. I have to look into that uh, to to see like what's what's the state there. So uh, I have another question, if no one has any, uh, regarding the Nate Nate management. So it sounds like to me that you appeal to have some sort of direct uh, interfaces into Nate, but then I think the slides kind of went into that you don't really need any name manipulation directly, and everything is possible to do through this existing feedback cups. Did I get it right, or just this uh, managed uh, new oh. state is enough? Yeah, like so. This so this managed state would be enough to keep the the neighbor entry in a like periodically in a reachable state, uh, so that we can use it from the FIP lookup, and FIP lookup will then populate it for the XTP data path, right? Yeah, and like. Uh, so like the, the the existing infrastructure for that today, like with the NUD used state, which I think is one of the super old code that like came from came in from the earlier days. But like what it doesn't do is like it doesn't refresh it. Um, uh, like if if there was an uh, it doesn't refresh it by itself into the reachable uh, state, unless there is an external or like internal traffic event where you. Are, I don't know, try to ping this node or whatever. Uh, but it would be nice to uh, like um, have this completely self-managed by the kernel or by the neighboring subsystem because you know there's no need for 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 any of that to uh, have those external triggers. And for the source IP selection, we don't need any neighbor entries, just to make clear. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a comment from uh, author. Shameless plug, we compile CBPF to eBPF to do packet captures with libpcap, which supports matching on subnet support ranges. Yeah, I mean, like, a, that approach is possible as well. But if you, let's say, have a lot of entries, like a lot of, let's say, slash 32 ciders, um, and so on, like, I, I presume, like, this generated program gets really large pretty quickly um and we're so like in, in, yeah like i mean like in the in the case where you only have like the the few set of masks uh where you would have this unrolled loop let's say for i don't know 10 entries whatever but like you you, you could have thousands of uh uh you, you could have thousands of hash table entries where you would then match uh those IP addresses of interest, right? Yeah, you kind of end up trading uh, map entries for just like actual code. So we do use this yeah, yeah. Yeah. with like hundreds of entries, but of course there is 
a limit to the number of instructions and how many you can actually compile. Right. And one thing we actually want to do is um, like move this from the load balancer piece uh, actually in, into, the, in the, into the Kubernetes, like into the actual CNI data path. Uh, and there we already have BPF code in there. It's complex and then adding another thing that could bloat the code is like my biggest concern there is the verifier that we will trip over it and you know it it will it will reject the program in that case yeah it makes sense that's one of the the challenges it's generating ebpf yeah 